Mark Rogers, the Russell Wilson agent, went on the record with Adam Schefter and said he does want to play for Seattle, but if for some reason, if for some reason there were to be a trade, Russell would waive his no-trade clause for four teams, and he named them on the record. When has that ever happened? That is the most passive-aggressive, aggressive-aggressive, non-trade, trade demand I've ever seen. He, I look at it and I say, guy wants out, and they've sent an engraved invitation to four franchises to go ahead and put your best offers together and let's see what happens. Russell Wilson's agent put it on the table. All the chips pushed him out. We, we're going public with it. We don't want to be traded, but we'd be willing to go to these four teams that we have a no-trade clause, so you can't trade us to a crappy team. That's what agents are paid to do. I asked this question specifically to someone close to Russ, uh, and they said 60%. 60% he'll be there. I oh, have no intention of leaving my wife. <laughs> but oh. here's a list I have ready of four women I'd be happy to end up with. Wait, what? <laughs> that ain't great, fellas. And Brandon couched it as... 60% chance he stays. That means 40% chance he leaves. That is, that's two out of five. That's just a slightly worse than a coin flip. Siren sounding in the Puget Sound. I would be freaking yep. out if I'm a Seahawks fan because now it's real. Welcome to this latest podcast, Rob Staten and Robbie Williams with you here tonight. And there is another, another chapter in the Russell Wilson saga, which is going on and on. We're into week three of this now. The week started with Michael Silver revealing um, that the Seahawks starting point for any negotiation will be three first round picks. If you don't remember Michael Silver's connection to the Seahawks, cast your mind back to the end of the 2017 season. Before week 17, he revealed that the Seahawks were going to move on from Michael Bennett. They were going to move on from Richard Sherman, that eventually they were going to try and trade Earl Thomas, that a huge reset was on the cards. Everybody said, no chance. They're definitely not going to do that. They can't get out of Michael Bennett's contract. They only extended him 12 months ago. And lo and behold, a few weeks later, Michael Silver was proven 100% correct. And uh, that was clearly a source which was uh, probably somebody whose name rhymes with Ron Bider. And, um, and, and I, that's what I would imagine. And that is the close connection that Michael Silver has. So. The Seahawks, in my opinion, on Monday were just subtly dropping out there what the starting point was for negotiations. A few days past, a Colin Cowherd segment here, uh, a Mike Florio segment there. And then we get to the, to the Thursday big reveal, which is when everything exploded. An athletic report, which kind of went over old ground. You know, we talked about most of the stuff that was in the athletic report for a while. Um, but there were a few interesting revelations in there, one of which was that Wilson had stormed out of a meeting. And there was a quote at the end, a source close to Russell Wilson. There is only one source close to Russell Wilson. It's Mark Rogers saying, you know, will Wilson be a Seahawk next year? And the, and the response was, good question. Implying doubt that it could essentially go. Either way, off the back of that athletic report, it was, seems like every journalist in America had got a line on Wilson that they were perhaps saving for a rainy day. Jeremy Fowler, Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, Jason Lacanfora, everybody jumping in. And then the big one, the biggest one. And you always kind of wait for Adam Schefter, the heavyweight boxer of the NFL insider world, to weigh in and climb into the ring and knock everybody out. And he did with not just a I understand or a sources, but a direct, direct on the record quote from Mark Rogers listing four teams that Russell Wilson would be, prepa be prepared to be traded to. I mean, yes, there was the caveat of he wants to stay in Seattle, but, and everybody's been joking, Robbie, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, I love my wife, but, uh, you know, here's four supermodels that I'd quite happily, you know, run away with. You know, it's kind of like, that, you know, that's essentially what it was. Listen, it, it's a remarkable situation for it to have got this far the people who have been desperately clinging on to this being just a media creation, despite three years of, you know, constant reporting on not a perfect relationship between Wilson and the Seahawks, you know, surely they can't deny it anymore with this reveal from Adam Schefter. And then today we've had Brandon Marshall saying a lot of interesting stuff as well, Robbie. Listen, I, I've, we are going to get into this big time, but just 
what is your end of week reflection on everything that has happened in this ongoing saga? You know, for me, I was watching uh, uh, ESPN and, and Marcus Spears was on and I just like what he had to say. He came on and he was just like, I'm tired of Russ just leaving these little breadcrumbs around and all this stuff. Just tell us what you want. Tell us what you want. If you want to leave, then say you want to leave. If you if you want out, don't just be like, well, I want to stay, but I would want to go to these four teams if, if it's going to happen. Now, don't give us a little break. Just say what you want. If you want to stay in Seattle, tell us what you want. I want you to go get this player. I want to go get this player. I want to make this happen. Go out and tell us what you want. This is what I want to see Russ do because I'm, I'm tired of all the little breadcrumbs and, and kind of like, well, a lot of speculation back and forth, you know, what's going to happen? Is it this? Is it that? You know, and then you're reading all these people who just don't think it's real, but I mean, clearly people need to open their eyes to the situation. This is a real thing. This is really happening. Russ is, for me, he wants out. I mean, I, I think he, like Brandon Marshall said a couple of weeks ago, he's trying to find a classy way of doing it. He wants to get out of Seattle, but not make a lot of splashes, kind of keep that like, you know, I still loved Seattle and all these things. And, you know, things just didn't kind of work out the way, you know, I would hope. But the reality is, is he wants out, wants out of Seattle. The only way this is, and Ron, this is my opinion, no one else's, only way this has worked out they, Pete Carroll and Russ haven't talked in two weeks, right? They come together. Pete finally says, okay, Russ, I'm going to give you what you want for this year. Let's see what happens. And then Pete retires. Or not, not even retire. Next year, after the season, Pete steps down as head coach. Maybe he just takes the team president role instead. And, and he's not, not the head coach. He steps down. They go out. They find a different head coach to come in and kind of lay the groundwork for going forward. That Pete could still be part of the Seahawks, blah, 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 blah. That's the only way I see it really working out. Other than that, I mean... This is, I think a trade is at this point seems almost inevitable and, and it's unfortunate because just a couple of days ago I thought nah, I don't know I don't know if it's inevitable I kept thinking like it's probably the following year I think he wants to sit back and wait to see how this year goes and I know waiting you know not wasting a year but like seeing how the offseason goes I still think I don't think anything will happen if it doesn't happen before the draft I don't think they'll they'll trade him until after the season that's still kind of just my thought process in it but I think I think this is spiraling out of control fast. Yeah, I agree with what, what, a lot of what you've had to say there. I think that on Pete's future, I think I want to come back to that a little bit later on because I've got something to say on that. But I think you're right um, that it is time for Russell Wilson to stop arsing about here and just cut to the chase. You know, do you want out or not? And, and Brandon Marshall said it right off the bat. And everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people criticise Brandon Marshall. Oh, he's just trying to make a name for himself in the... Brandon Marshall doesn't need to... It's Brandon Marshall. He was doing TV shows when he was playing for the Bears years ago. He's been on the TV forever. If he's not on the TV anymore, he can just retire to his mansion and sit on his pile of money and swim around in it like Scrooge McDuck. He doesn't need to make a name for himself. You know, he's, he's just telling you what, what is real. And he said three weeks ago, he thinks Russell Wilson's just done in Seattle and he wants out and he doesn't believe in Pete Carroll's vision anymore. And I think you're right. He just wants to get out in the classiest possible way. But in the end, in, in his sort of ham-fisted attempt to do it in a classy way, he's just kind of pissing everybody off because we keep getting this kind of weekly drip feed of stuff. And like, we, you know, I'm, I'm going to come back to Marshall's comments in a second, but he says that Carol and Wilson haven't talked for two weeks. You know, I've just got this mental image of, like, you know, a teenage boyfriend and girlfriend who've had a row and each of them refusing to pick up the phone and just being really stubborn as their friends get increasingly frustrated with them both and just force them into a room somewhere and say, just get on with it and make up. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very frustrating to follow. And I kind of, personally, Robbie, I just want to know what's going on now. Is Wilson going? Then he is just get the best offer. We know the four teams he's willing to go to now. Cards on the table, best offer, get on with it. If there's a way to salvage this, and only Pete Carroll knows whether there is or not, get on a Zoom call or get in a room if you're even allowed to at the moment and just get this sorted. You know, otherwise, there's, there's just no benefit from this going on any longer. The Seahawks have tried to sort of not say anything and, you know, they've got a lot of credit in the local media. Oh, the clever Seahawks, they don't want to get involved. They don't want to say anything. Well, you've tried that and Wilson's not going to let you get away with that. He's not going to let you just sort of watch this disappear. He's not letting it disappear. It's going on and on. And if they don't address it this weekend, Robbie, we'll be talking about it again next week. 
And I just found it incredible that it's come to Mark Rogers on the record telling Adam Schefter, the four teams, the Bears, the Cowboys, the Raiders and the Saints, which he would go to. And I think Wilson wants out. Um, I think he is agitating to go. I think he wants to go and play for an offensive-minded head coach. He wants to go and have the power. I think that there's a very specific reason why he's named those four teams, Robbie. I think it's because they know he will get the power. Um, this is purely about the type of team that Pete Carroll wants and the type of team that Russell Wilson wants, and they clash. And it's tied into Wilson's legacy, what he thinks will deliver championships and what will deliver him the, the goals that he wants to tick off in his career. You know, time's running out for Russell. He's going to be 33 this year. He hasn't got forever, even though he speaks like he wants to play till 45. He's well aware that he might have eight more years and if that and that's it. So he's, he's going to have to move quickly. And I don't think he thinks that his future uh, is, is with the Seahawks and he wants a change. So let's just get on with it. The latest on Brandon Marshall, I, we, we should mention this because he is sort of leaking information very well. Um, he says that um, it's 60-40, he's hearing, that Wilson will stay. Now, if you'd have said, and people will go, well, that's 60% chance that he will stay in Seattle. If you'd have said to anybody, what's the chances that Russell Wilson stays in Seattle two weeks ago? I imagine that most people in the media would have said 90%. So the fact that we're now down at 60 is, and, and, it's, and to me, that is shrinking by the time. Um, it, it implies that this is very likely, or not very likely, but it's increasingly likely to happen this year. And that's a 40%, 40%, not insignificant amount that he's traded this year, despite all of the talk of $39 million dead cap hits. And I want to come on to that as well. Increasingly, it looks like he's going to go this year. Um, Carol and Wilson haven't talked in two weeks. They're not talking. Um, he says that the Bears are talking behind the scenes about what they can put together. And what I want to say, you know, it, it, it's going one way, Robbie. We all know it's going one way. If you're not willing to admit it yet, then, you know, you're kidding yourself, frankly. And I'm sorry to have to put it that bluntly, but that's, that's where we're at with this. So what I want to do is I want to look at these four teams, Robbie, and, and sort of look at why this is actually, I think, a good thing for the Seahawks that Wilson has named these four teams. The, be the Bears are desperate. They are absolutely desperate. They have a GM and a head coach who are hanging by a thread. They are lucky to still be in a job. And the GM, Ryan Pace, is the guy and will always be remembered as the guy who took who traded up for Mitchell Trubisky when he could have stayed at number three and had Mahomes or Deshaun Watson. And that will be on his tombstone, I'm afraid, unless, unless he does something about it. And the one thing he can do to change everything about he, how he is known as a GM is to trade for Russell Wilson. It's as simple as that. He will go from a zero to a hero overnight for delivering Russell Wilson. And from a Seahawks perspective, you could pretty much ask for whatever you wanted from the Bears, in my opinion, as a consequence. Now, look, I'm not getting every draft pick for three years. That's not going to happen. But you could go to them and you can be in a strong, powerful negotiating position because the Bears are desperate. The other, th uh, other three teams, Jerry Jones is 79. Now, I want to read this to you, Robbie, because I think this is laughable, frankly. This is now the, the NFL have uh, Jane Slade to cover the Cowboys for them, the in-house media. And apparently she said today that the Cowboys find a Wilson trade scenario laughable. She reports that Dallas declined to trade Alden Smith to Seattle last season because the Seahawks had asked for too much for Earl Thomas and then trumped Dallas for Jamal Adams. Now, that's embarrassing from the Cowboys, if that's true, that they wouldn't, you know, and it's, and it's ridiculous if they're not willing to go down this route because of, of what they've said there. My hunch after reading that, and I'm sorry that I'm banging on again. I'll let you come in in a sec. I'm wondering whether the Dallas already know that they're going to get outbid for Russell Wilson. They've got no chance because of teams like the Bears. And they just want to make it seem like we're not interested. No, no, no. We're not, never even got anywhere near Russell Wilson because they just know that it's better to be sort of distancing themselves now, knowing that when it actually comes push to shove, they ain't going to win this one. I think that's what that's about. Just my opinion. Vegas. They've moved to um, a franchise that is uh, moved to a city, Robbie, that is not a football city. It's not a football state, really, is it? 
Um, they've got to sell tickets. They're not going to sell tickets losing, you know, five out of six every at the end of every season. Mark Davis is Al Davis's son. He needs a splash. John Gruden loves Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson will remember Gruden fondly from his draft sort of situation. Defensive-minded coach will give him power. They, I'd be very surprised if the Raiders didn't come up with a massive package because they want Russell Wilson on a huge billboard around Las Vegas saying, get your tickets and come and watch this guy play Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert. That sells tickets. They're going to be big time on this. And then you've got the Saints. Now, the Saints are an interesting one because I think what the Saints should and probably will do, Robbie, is I think they will pick up the phone to the Seahawks and they will say to John Schneider, what do you want? What do you want? Let's just tell me what, tell us what you want and, and just tell us and lay it out and we'll see if we can make it happen. And then the Seahawks could go away and they'll look at New Orleans' roster and they'll be able to pick what they want and they'll be able to name their price in terms of draft picks. And that's when the negotiating will start with the Saints. Because everyone says they haven't got the draft stock and they haven't got this and they haven't got that. I think the Saints will go to the Seahawks and go, look, we're picking at the end of round one. We're probably going to be picking at the end of round one for the next few years. What do you want? Because we're 75 million over the, over the cap. So if we can move some guys and get Russell Wilson, we'll do it. And I think that's how that negotiation will start. And I actually think that's not a bad place for the Seahawks to be with a roster as good as the Saints. So I actually think by naming these four teams, Wilson's actually done Seattle a favor. There's actually some negotiating to be done there, which could make it interesting for the Seahawks. What do you think about those four teams? Well, <clears throat> let me just start with the Cowboys situation. I just think that's a silly. If they, they're all butthurt because we outbid for Jamal Adams and we off, asked too much for Earl Thomas, like it's just weird. And I think probably what it comes down to is they don't want to lose negotiating rights or you know, the negotiating tactic for, for Dak, you know, if they, if Dak hears that they are actually going after Wilson, then, you know, he could, you know, he could get butt hurt and be like, well, now I want more money if you want me to come play for you or whatever. So they probably are avoiding trying to avoid that sort of scenario. I, I read a tweet and I was trying to find it before I, before we got on the podcast, Rob, but the, there's something that somebody had said is like, you just don't trade a hall of fame QB for, for three round picks that are in all all in the high 20s and it, and for me i kind of agree with that i think trading wilson for three first round picks sounds great but if they're all in the high 20s i don't know man like for me it's just that something about that doesn't sit right i mean you think about the players that are there and 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 you know you you, you have to have you have to have somebody in place and, and so if you're looking at a team like at the saints who were, you know, picking what 28th or something like that, like who you had, and then you have to think who you're going to replace Russ with. If you, we can pick their roster, like uh, pick apart their roster. You know, I, mean, I, I, I don't know who you're going to go out and get, but like if you grab a corner and, and, and Alvin Kamara or something, just something like that. I mean, if you're that, and then a couple first round picks, I mean, how much better are you really going to be? You don't have a quarterback in place, you know, and then you have to worry about trading up to get a quarterback or, or, you know, you bring in someone like a, you know, Mariota or, or, or someone like that. And, and, and you, you know, Cam New. I mean, I don't know. There's like, you have to have something in place and, and, and I just don't like what's available out there. So I mean, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to trade someone uh, in the high 20s. So that's why the bears, I mean, they're what they're picking 20th. Um, you know, I mean, I've seen some, some trade scenarios where, where it, the bears make sense and I could be like, okay, I might be able to get on board with that. But again, they're going to be picking high twenties and, and, and such. And, I really don't want to trade them in the NFC, if I'm being honest. So if I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the Raiders, period. They pick, what, 17th or 16th or 17th. Um, they're the team that, you know, they're the AFC. You know, I, I like the idea of maybe getting like Josh Jacobs and, and then a bunch of first-round picks from them or, or something, like going and kind of picking their roster apart instead. Uh, you know, the Saints, I just, again, they're in the NFC. I, don't, I just don't want to see – I don't want to play Russ – against them i just don't and so for me I'm, I'm looking at teams in the afc and when the original report came out they said they they had approached seattle about a trade and then other teams a couple other teams were listed the jets the dolphins were listed and i don't know who who that actually came from but now that mark rogers says, no, no no it's just these four teams i wonder how interested he would be playing like right now he might not be interested in playing you know for those teams but what if you know the dolphins come in and said hey we're gonna give you the three to 18 two first round picks the following year and, and two or something like for me that's more appealing than than you know some some of these higher 20s that that other teams can offer um but i mean again all this comes down to play you're gonna have to trade you're still gonna have to trade 
Jamal Adams. You're still going to have to trade Bobby Wagner. Like if we're going to trade Russ, I keep saying like, you got to blow it up. Like you can't just like hold on to these guys and think it's going to happen. You have to wonder what's going to happen with DK Metcalf. You know, he's going to be, he's going to be pissed. I just don't think he's going to like having to play for another quarterback unless that quarterback comes in and is able to light it up and get him, the, get him the football. Like, like Russ was able to. So I don't know, man, interesting four teams for sure. I mean, I haven't got a chance to really go look at the roster to kind of see, you know, who, who that we could trade, but um, for me, right out the gate, I, I, I like the Raiders more than I like the other three teams. So, I mean, I think on Dak Prescott, there's, there seems to be a dynamic within some sections of the um, Dallas media that seems to be suggesting that Dak Prescott's injury is more of a concern than I think people realize. Now, let's just remember, it was a very bad ankle injury that Dak Prescott had. I was actually watching that game live when it happened. And it was one of those moments where you, you know, you really turn away from the screen. It was a really bad injury. It will not be a surprise if that Prescott takes a long time to come back fully. And the belief is that, that, that people don't think he's, you're going to really know how close he is to returning until June, July. Now that's a real problem for the Cowboys. And um, I'm not sure that that message earlier was a, uh, oh, crap, we don't want to spoil things with Dak because I think what the Cowboys are going to have to do if they don't trade for Russell Wilson is franchise Dak and then wait and see and see where he is. And it may be a case of they rescind the tag if he doesn't sign it. And it could be a case of they just sort of play that year out and then move on. I I mean, I don't know. It's, It's a really sad and difficult situation involving Dak Prescott. I'm not sure that what the Cowboys were doing there was necessarily... Um, trying to protect negotiations that I genuinely believe that this is moving at a faster pace than people think. And I think that is the Cowboys trying to save face because look at the reaction in Chicago to even the mere possibility that Russell Wilson will go there. The fans are positively giddy. I bet Bears fans didn't sleep last night. They were so I, I had a Bears fan friend text me this morning and said, Wilson's going to look great in a Bear uniform. He texted they, me literally this uh, morning. I bet someone has already ordered a Wilson jersey and is having that delivered right now. Um, they are so excited about this. And if you're a Cowboys fan, I suspect a lot of Cowboys fans will be getting their hopes up as well. Now, if you know that, well, the Bears are going to kind of go here and the Raiders will go here, and you don't want any part of that, Cowboys, then the best thing to do right now is just distance yourself from everything. It's just to go, no, we, we're not in this. And actually, we're going to make, what's the best way we can make it look like we're not in it? We'll go to Jane Slater, who's our source, and we'll come up with some daft stuff about Jamal Adams and Alden Smith and Earl Thomas. And people will really believe that we're not in this now. In fact, they're going to think that there's a huge bad blood between the Seahawks and the Cowboys, and no one's going to get the hopes of it at all. That's what I think is going on. I think they just know that they don't have the chops to get into a, a bidding battle with the Bears and the Raiders and maybe even the Saints. But I do think that Jerry Jones would have been interested because Jerry Jones is 79 and is obsessed with winning a Super Bowl before he hands this franchise off to his son. He is obsessed with that. He's desperate for it. I think he feels like he's running out of time to do that. And I think he would have been very interested in Russell Wilson. I just don't think he's prepared to go as far as someone like the Bears. On the don't pick in the 20s, here's the thing, right? Whoever you trade Russell Wilson to is going to be picking in the 20s after this year. You know, Russell Wilson is a, he gets you to nine wins just for his mere presence. So he, more often than not, he'll get you in the playoffs. And with seven teams getting in now, Robbie, there's a decent chance that the best you're going to get is like picking 20 or something like that. So you're really only hoping that a really bad team who's picking in the top 10 now will give you a top 10 pick this year. And then from next year, you just accept that you're just getting late first rounders with Russell Wilson. That's how you've got to approach. You might get lucky, but probably not. And I don't actually think this is a great year to be picking in the top 10. I think even if you don't want to draft a quarterback, it's not a great year to pick in the top 10. I don't think the, I think if you were after Jamar Chase, it might be good, but you've got DK Metcalf. I think if you um, wanted a left tackle, yeah, you'd, you'd have to be in the top five to get ahead of Cincinnati for Penny Sewell. Apart from that, Robbie, this is not a great, I don't think, a great year to be picking in the top 10. 
So I'm not actually that bothered about that. I, I would actually personally, and, and this is maybe this is, and people will accuse me of just because I'm at a draft blog, but this is the way I feel. I want as many picks as possible between 20 and 75. That's what I want. That's what I think the strength of this draft is. I could give you 10 names right now that in that range could make you a better football team. So if I could pick three, four times in that range, I would take that over one top 10 pick this year, personally. So I actually don't mind getting a pick 17 with the Raiders, 20 with the Bears, even New Orleans at 31. If I got 17, I'd trade down. There'll be Seahawks fans wanting to throw their screens across the room at me saying that. I get it because we trade down and then you don't pick well in the first round or the top of the second. That's what the Seahawks have done. But the point is not to have picks in, is not to have any picks in that range. It's to do better with the picks that you have because over the years, um, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to validate my own opinion and say that I know everything. But on, on our blog, we talked about TJ Watt and we talked about Nick Chubb. And we talked about all those receivers a couple of years ago, including DK Metcalf and Debo Samuel and all those guys. And, and, you, and we talked last year about Jonathan um, Taylor and people like that. So you can find those guys somewhat easily and you just have to take them and not overthink it by drafting people like LJ Collier and Rashad Penny and Marquis Blair. It's as simple as that. And if you do a better job with that, then you can get the foundation of a team that can move forward. So I'm not as bothered about picking in the 20s. Miami, I think there's a reason they haven't been. I don't think Russell wants to pay, play for one, a Belichick disciple, and two, um, a defensive-minded coach. And I think that's, that's it. And maybe and, and Miami are a year removed from taking Tua. Maybe they just sort of feel like, yeah, do you know what? We, we'd be interested, but not at the kind of price that others will go to. And with DK Metcalf, I think his sort of happiness is certainly going to be in jeopardy if you trade Russell Wilson. And he's becoming more outspoken. He, I think, sympathizes with Wilson's position. And, you know, when there's somebody who was, you know, four months ago, Robbie, Russell Wilson was saying, me and DK, we're going to be Montana and Rice. And if within four months, Russell's playing for the Raiders and DK Metcalf's got a rookie throw into him, that's a very different situation. You're right, there could be some... There could be some issues there, but here's the thing. The Seahawks kind of have his control for at least another two years. So I think that that gives them the kind of time to win him round. If not, they might have to trade him in a couple of years. But you might want to do that anyway rather than paying him 20 odd million dollars a year, whatever it's going to cost at that point. So I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable about the late round picks. I think what it is for me is coming out of this Robbie feeling like okay, you're giving up a franchise quarterback, but the roster is not in... You want to come out of it after all a draft and everything feeling like there's a chance at least to be competitive, to have some excitement as a fan as to what is next. And, and the way to do that is to have a quarterback you don't even necessarily really believe in, but you just have a bit of excitement about. And... It's hard to think who that could be. Obviously, if you trade with the Raiders, you might get Derek Carr in return or Marcus Mariota. You ain't getting anybody with the Bears, Dallas or New Orleans, however much Mike Florio wants to tout Taysom Hill, Taysom Tebow. Um, I mean, if Dallas traded for him, it probably means Dak enters the open market as a free agent and you could perhaps negotiate with Dak. But then again, you probably have to wait till June to find out whether he's going to even play this year. Um, I, I, and you've got the draft. And look, I want to talk about a couple of players that I've written about today in the draft, Robbie, uh, that could be potential options. But I, when I did look at the Saints roster and the, and the Raiders roster and the Bears roster, there was a package that I could be comfortable with embracing the fact that a trade feels inevitable. And let's just put it that way. I'm not saying that I want Wilson to go, but I could imagine packages whereby I go, okay, that's exciting to me. I'm excited to see what happens next. Even if it goes badly wrong, I'm at least invested in how is this going to play out? That's, and, and for that reason, I'm comfortable with these four teams. And, I, and I, I think if Wilson had come out and said, I'm only going to the Saints, you've got a problem. I think the presence of the other three, in particular Chicago and, and Las Vegas, make it interesting for Seattle. Yeah, I mean, it gives them bidding more, right? So, like, you can have teams bidding against each other and be like, well, you got to up your offer. Like, this other team's, you know, offering a package of this. Like, you got to put something that 
better than that. And so I get that. Um, I have a couple of things that I, I read that I want to read to you, Robin. And I find this fairly interesting. Um, <clears throat> one of them came from, from Mike Silver. Uh, he actually had said that uh, there's belief that Wilson may have had MV, MVP fever and that he was trying to force things and play hero ball a little bit more. Um, he also notes that uh, that it's starting to catch up to him and, and Wilson was aware or that Carol was aware of it and trying to pull them and tried to dial him back. Uh, I found that interesting. And then this is another one that I found kind of interesting. Uh, one veteran coach, to coach told the athletic that after a 17, 12 loss of the giants last December, he didn't think Wilson would thrive in a more pass oriented attack. Like he's seeking people say their protection is not that good. The whole let Russ cook thing. He is better when they can, when they can run the ball and play off that. There's no question. No one likes that because they want him to be Dan Marino. Well, he is not Dan Marino. You are who you are, but he looks bad right now. And if you start thinking about it, there's this thing that, that you wonder if this is a PR thing for Russ, right? He played so bad in the second half of the season. Maybe he's trying to play this PR thing and think, well, that, if you don't think I'm that good, I'd trade me to these teams. These are the four teams that I, I, I consider playing for. Um, but I think he knows, like, I, I mean, the reality of the situation is I think Carroll is getting up there in age. Like, I can't even remember all of these right now, but he's getting up there and he's only got like a couple of years left. I don't think he wants to start over with a rookie quarterback there might be some thought thinking, well, we, we won, you know, with, with Russ as a second year starter or whatever, and, and was able to win the Super Bowl. And if we could construct a roster like that, they might be able to do that. But, you know, maybe, maybe there's some thought behind that, but I don't also think that he's not really willing to risk that. So I think there's some, some, some truth to that. It could be, this is just a, something they need to work out together. And Russ is trying to protect himself. And, and Pete's just like, I mean, I, the weird thing is we haven't really heard much from from Pete or, or John Snyder about it, right? You know, all we're hearing is, you know, teams have made calls. This is what we're, the, the starting point is three first round picks. You know, there's a lot of different, you know, scenarios. This is why I want Russ just to come on and say, what the hell do you want? Do you want to be traded? Then just say, I want to be traded. Like, just don't quit leading these breadcrumbs around. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things about there. I've actually found these last two quotes fairly interesting. When you get your thoughts on those. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think it is interesting. I think with Carol, I heard something earlier, Robbie, which kind of made me think because I would have agreed with that comment about five hours ago, and then I heard something that made me change my mind on Carol's position on on whether on you know whether he wants to rebuild and all this, and it was Florio, and he said, you know, the feeling is that Carol, while he's seventy this year and he's not got long left, and then he he said that he was interviewing. Uh, or that Belichick had said some, I oh know, sorry, I'll get my words right. Robert Kraft had done an interview and said that he hoped Belichick would coach until he was 80. And then Pete Carroll was at the Super Bowl and Florio said to him, hey, Robert Kraft says he hopes that uh, Belichick coaches until he's 80. And Pete Carroll interrupted and went, well, why stop there? And Florio said, what he actually wonders is, you know, as much as Russell Wilson says he wants to play for another 15 years, he wonders whether Pete Carroll actually plans on coaching for another 10. And I actually sat there and thought, I could see that. I, I could imagine Russ, uh, Pete Carroll thinking, I'm not limiting myself to five more years or three or two, that actually he may well want to coach for 10. And if that's the case, I, listen, I don't think Pete Carroll anticipated this. I don't think he wanted this. I don't think he saw this coming. I think this has surprised and probably really disappointed him. I suspect he's probably more disappointed with this than he has been by any player in the past. And, you know, how disappointed he will have been with Earl Thomas and perhaps Sherm in the past or Michael Bennett. I think this is probably the thing that has rocked him the most because Wilson is being so public about this. But here's the thing. It's like, Whatever you want, whatever your plans are, the minute the franchise quarterback says, I want to go, you kind of have no choice. People have been saying to me today on Twitter things like the, the Seahawks have all the leverage and they have all this. And if they don't want to trade him, they don't have to. Well, yeah, but you also don't want to go in a training camp next year with the quarterback very clearly not believing in your way of doing things, not believing that you're on the right track, not really buying in having called out the offensive line, having called out, you know, the franchise essentially, having flirted with leaving, and then 
you may well think, well, it's okay. We'll just rock up to training camp. And then when Russell Wilson does an interview, you know, and the Seattle media, well, it's the Seattle media. So they might just ask him, you know, what shoes he's wearing that day. I mean, who knows? But, you know, presumably they will ask him about it and say, hey, Russ, what about all that? And then guess what? He plays well in the week one. And then you have a whole week of, well, they should let Russ cook, shouldn't they? You should do what he says more often. And then the Seahawks lose maybe a game. And then you have, well, they should, this wouldn't have happened if they let Russ cook. Or Russell plays badly when they threw it a little bit more than they ran. And you get, well, well you know, how's Russell going to feel about this now? Because he's played poorly despite getting his own way. And the whole season will just have this huge cloud hanging over it. And Pete's a positive guy and Pete's all in, protect the team, all of these mantras. I'm sorry. But that doesn't, that, you might as well screw all that up and throw it in the bin if Russell Wilson is still the quarterback next season under, without any kind of truce because it's just not sustainable. And as much as Pete might not want to rebuild and might not want to do all this, I think we're getting to a point now, Robbie, where he's kind of just going to have to. And he's going to, he, they're probably going to have to identify a veteran quarterback who they can roll with. And if a trade happens, they'll have to go with that. Um, they'll have to draft someone unless there is a truce. Now, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of Pete and Russell getting together next week or over this weekend, having it out, and next week them saying they've agreed to to sort of give it another year or whatever. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't rule that out. But right now, it's hard to imagine that. Right now, with the Mark Rogers report, I'm more inclined to think that a parting is is nigh, but I also wouldn't rule out, you know, some kind of truce. But whether it's now or next year or the year after, personally, Robbie, I think you've got to start planning ahead. And I wrote an article earlier saying, I think whatever happens in any situation, they've got to seriously consider drafting a quarterback. I think you need a guy in the chamber. And yet it's a, it's a real shame they only have four picks because if they had 10, it'd be easier to justify. But if you're potentially going to lose Russell Wilson in a year, you don't want to be in this situation again with no options really on the roster or, you know, having to sort of see what's out there or make an expensive trade yourself to get somebody else uh, who's, who's of a Derek Carr level quality. You, what you really want is somebody there who you can work with, who can learn the playbook and you might be able to just pass the torch on to. And I think they've got to get some more draft stock, Robbie, and one of their picks has to go on a quarterback this year, whether Wilson's here or not. And maybe we'll come on to that a little bit more in the future. But I just fa- I'm fascinated by this, Robbie. I'm not somebody personally who feels particularly upset or disappointed by this. I think this is pro sports. You know, in, in the NFL, guys stick around in teams for a long time. I'm just going to give you a perspective from English soccer. Players move all the time. Cristiano Ronaldo's played for Man United and Real Madrid and Juventus. You know, players just move. People like Lionel Messi are very rare who just play at one team for the, you know, the whole of their career. And even maybe he'll move in, in the summer. In the NFL, it's kind of like guys stay around, franchise quarterbacks stay around. I'm not too precious about this. And I actually think that a churn every now and again does a team good. I don't think it's realistic to do what New England did with Brady and Belichick and just stick around forever. And I think you've got to get ahead of the curve. And right now, Robbie, if Russell Wilson wants to go, I think you have to sort of exploit teams like the Bears and the Raiders and their utter desperation. And I think you have to take advantage of the Deshaun Watson situation. Deshaun Watson's out there and everybody wants to trade for him. And the Texans are saying no. So go and find one of those teams who's willing to give the house to Deshaun Watson and get a Deshaun Watson deal for Russell Wilson and just move on. If Wilson wants to go, move on and just get on with it. That's what you pay John Schneider to do. Now it's a big problem to fix, but just get on with it as far as I'm concerned. So if it's, if it's not repairable, get on with it. If it is get on with it, but this needs solving now, not in a month, not after the draft, not going into training camp. It needs sorting. Now I want them to put a deadline on it in the same way they did with Wilson's contract extension. I want a deadline for this to be sorted. And if it's not sorted, then it needs to, it needs to be re- resolved with via a trade. And unfortunately, you were right earlier. The only real way to resolve this, Robbie, is for Pete to say, we're going to do what you want. 
And I'm not convinced Pete's going to do that. No, I, I 100% agree. Get, get, it, get it sorted out now. I mean, <clears throat> before the draft, you know, try to fleece one of these teams that is just desperate for a quarterback, like you said, like the Bears or whatever, and just get a haul of picks and a haul of players and whatever you can get and, and, and make it happen and, and, and move on. <clears throat> um, you know, it, it, it's frustrating to be in this situation, you know, when, when clearly you can see like some of the decisions that we've made that have just been so poor and it's led to this decision. But I think, you know, reading like how Russ was like, he walked, he stormed out of a, you know, out of a press con or out of a, a, you know, a meeting room when they were talking about how to fix the offense. And then he called Pete and, and what are you going to do for the offensive line? Like, what are you going to do to fix it? And he didn't like the answer. And then that's when he went on the radio radio station or whatever, the Dan Patrick show and kind of said what he said. And I, I kind of wonder what that conversation was like. You think back, like, okay, he probably called Pete and was like, what, what is your plan? He, his plan is probably like, well, we're going to probably try to re-sign Ethan Posick for a decent a decent, you know, contract, and then we'll draft a left guard in, in, in the draft or, and, and have them compete with Phil Haynes and, and see what happens. And, you know, the rest of the line is good. And that probably just didn't sit well with Russ. He probably wants, you know, a Corey Lindsay or someone out there that's going to be, you know, a, a difference maker that can stop Aaron Donald from from sacking him as much as he's, he's getting and, and you know, stop Michael Brockers or whoever it is that's coming off the edge or, or uh, Leonard Floyd or whoever it is coming to get him. And he's probably tired of that. And so I, I imagine the conversation, you know, with Pete saying like, this is what we're going to do. And it just sounds so boring. I think about like that conversation, what happened, like, I don't want them to go sign, you know, you know, Ethan Posick to a three-year deal, you know, whatever, and, and have him play center for the next three years. It just doesn't sound appealing. He wasn't, it, that, it wasn't that good you know, go get a, a top end center and, and, you know, I don't left guard. If you're going to, uh, you know, if you want to draft one, great. I mean, I'm, I, I've been reading your regardless about some of the guys that are available and, you know, it seems like there could be some good guys that we could pick up. So I'm all for it, you know, because of just of how well that, <clears throat> you know, Damian Lewis played and such, but yeah, I, mean, I just like, I don't want it to be boring. I want them to, I want them to make a bold decision, whether it's like trade Jamal Adams for to the Miami for 18 and trade back and get back into that 20 and get back into this draft and then trade Bobby, do some of these things and, you know, beef up that O line and, you know, go get a third wide receiver. I mean, you know, do something bold. And if the boldness is going to be trade Wilson, you better get a haul. And I think at that point you also really should consider if not blowing it up, then, then, you know, doing a lot of different moves. I still think you have to trade Jamal Adams and, and Bobby Wagner as well and make some decisions there on who's going to be the leader of this team, who's going to like lead us forward. And then you really got to get back to that, to that run game and you better get it. I mean, you cannot have, I mean, in my opinion, you can't have Rashad Penny leading the way. I mean, we haven't seen enough from him yet. We need a, you know, a, a, a workhorse that's going to do it. And someone like Josh Jacobs would, would appeal in that situation. So, yeah, I mean, you got to go get a haul. And, I, and, and you're right, it has to happen soon. So I think they should set a deadline, whether it's – I think it needs to be happening before the draft. So go set a deadline, make it happen, and, and, and talk it out. If you, if you can't come to an agreement, then just to agree to part ways. You can do it classy and just be like, yeah, you know, we just don't think it's, you know – we don't think it's going to work out. You know, I don't, I want to do it this way. He wants to do that. Way. It's fine. We just have different philosophies and we're just going to move on. That's fine. Then do it. Yeah. And, and I'm looking at sort of deals now and I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this, um, you know, potential deals. And so I, let me pitch, cause I, I'm, I'm eliminating the Cowboys from this point, just because of what they've said. And I like my theory. I'm, I'm enjoying, I, I sort of buy into my own theory there. You know, it's probably quite an arrogant thing to do, but I, I think that they're, that sort of little leak to Jane Slater is a, you know, like, well, we're not interested anyway, kind of response um, because they know they're not going to get him. But um, so th- what I would say is starting point was three first round picks, according to Michael Silver. I'm sort of thinking, right, well, what was, you know, Jamal Adams cost two firsts, a third and a player. So the franchise court about how does that relate to a blitzing safety? I still can't believe that they did that trade. Anyway, um, what, what, What's the sort of comparison there? Well, three first round picks for me, a second round pick and a player, but a better player than Brandon McDougall. That is kind of the deal that I'm thinking with all of these teams. And it may be that there's more. It's hard to project, isn't it? I mean, like, God, the Bears could offer three firsts, three seconds and a player. Who knows? It, it depends. If a bidding war starts, one, it's like once you get to three firsts, Robbie, and a second and a player, if the Raiders then offer three firsts, two seconds and a player, if you're the Bears, having offered that much, are you really backing out at that point? I mean, then you make an offer, and then yeah, that's when you get in a good position. And you have two teams, and it's like, who's going to go the highest to get this done? That's what the Seahawks need if they're going to trade Russell Wilson. And I think that could happen. Um, 
but I'm just going to sort of go with a basic sort of, I'm not going to get too daft because if you get silly, then people just dismiss it. So I'm just going to come up with a, what I think is a reasonable ish proposal. And you tell me if this is the kind of thing that you could buy into. So three firsts, including for this is for the bears number 20 this year, their second round pick this year and a player. Now the, the player that I would love to have is Khalil Mack. The only problem with Khalil Mack is he has a huge dead cap hit. So in order to move him, the bears would be paying an obscene amount of money. And I, I, you know, I, I part of me wonders whether the cap even means anything these days, Robbie, because there are so, I mean, like if the Rams can trade Goff and bring in Stafford and be 33 million over the cap, then part of me just wonders whether anything goes. And you know, the Seahawks will be like minus five over the cap if they trade Russell Wilson. I know people think that, that I'll just, let me just get this out of the way. People go on about 39 million and that next year is more preferable. It's still going to cost you $26 million next year for Russell Wilson to go and play somewhere else. So yeah, there's a $13 million difference. We're talking for a billion dollar industry here and a, and a team that when it's sold is going to cost billions of dollars. $13 million is nothing to the Seahawks. And if you trade him now you, and before June the 1st, rather than spreading the cap hit this year and next, you just wipe him off the books for 2022. You create... $37 million of cap space for 2022 if you trade him now. So yeah, you get a hit this year, but from next year, and by the way, you can sign free agents this year and backload their contracts. So you can bring guys in this year who the bulk of their money goes out next year when Russell Wilson's deal comes off the books. So there is actually a method to the madness here of a $39 million cap hit. And if he was free next year and 39 million this year, I get it. But it's not. It's twenty-six million dollars next year. You only cut, you only lose an extra seven million. You don't get, add thirty-nine million onto your hit salary right now. It's a dead cap hit. You're already tied to Wilson for thirty-two million. So it's a seven million extra hit that you take this year. So it puts you on minus five, which is still better than ten teams in the league. That's where we're at. So anyway, Khalil Mack is the Bears is the one that I want, but I'm not singing. Um, he. Akeem Hicks is probably the other. And that's, and that's sort of the, the consolation prize. Akeem Hicks is a bit older. He's not as good as Khalil Mack for me, Robbie, but he has no dead cap here. I mean, it's like a million dollars. So I've always liked Akeem Hicks. I think the Seahawks have always needed someone like Akeem Hicks who can cause trouble from the interior. Maybe they feel they don't need an interior rusher with Jaron Reed and Puda Ford and uh, everybody else, Brian Manet. Cedric Lattimore, maybe they don't feel like they need that anymore. But I've always liked Akeem Hicks. I would take him if Mac is, is not an option. When I look at the rest of the, the Bears roster, there's not really anybody else that I see as a, a very likely option there. So Akeem Hicks is, is kind of the guy that I'm pitching to you. What do you think? I don't love it. <laughs> to be honest, I would rather have Khalil Mack a hundred times over. I mean, I think he's obviously the dominant player and guy we should have targeted a long time ago in the in the trade. But yeah, I I just don't think that's enough for me um, for a franchise quarterback because then we're still in the situation of who do we have playing quarterback for us? And so you know, as great as that might be, is for having someone like like him come in. Like I think we need a difference maker, and Khalil Mack is a difference maker in my opinion. So I would rather have him. Uh, Keem Nix is he's kind of meh for me in terms of just to sort of let everybody know what the exact situation is with Khalil Mack his um, dead cap hit for 2021 is 37 and a half million dollars his salary cap hit is 26.6 if they traded him pre-June the first it would cost the Bears 11 million dollars extra on top of their cap which you know what for the sake of having Russell Wilson how aggressive do you want to be okay for the sake of having Russell Wilson, maybe they would pay Khalil Mack to go and play in Seattle. And actually for the Seahawks, his base salary is $17 million this year and it's 12 next year. So you'd be getting an absolute bargain by having Khalil Mack. And if you're the Seahawks, you may well just say, no, no, we need to have Khalil Mack as part of this deal. So if you want to pay Khalil Mack $37 to play for us this year, then that's what you need to do because we're paying $39 million for Russell Wilson. In fact, you know what? I'm talking myself into it, Robbie. I'm talking myself into it. If the Seahawks are saying, hang on a minute, we're paying $39 million for Russell Wilson to play for you. You can pay $37 million 
for Khalil Mack to pay for us. It's a fair trade. Throw Khalil I, Mack in there. I agree. Do it. Yeah. Perfect. Get him in there. You know, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it, how you just talk these things through and you suddenly have this epiphany moment because, you know, I was under the assumption because everyone's been saying it, you can't trade Khalil Mack because of this, that and the other. Well, of course you can. If you're trading Russell Wilson for this, they trade Khalil Mack for that. You get him for $17 million this year. It's an absolute bargain. You're like Carlos Dunlap up across Khalil Mack. And hey, guess what? You have a great defense. You have a four-man rush. I, do you know what? I'm, I'm down with that. Khalil, get yourself in navy blue or whatever it's called. I can't remember what the blue is called in Seattle now. Um, Seahawk blue? I don't know. Get over here, man. Get rushing that passer. Um, so there you go. So Khalil, Matt, maybe not as unrealistic as first thought. I've upgraded from Akeem Hicks. Um, Raiders. So the Raiders, Robbie, I think this is harder because let's just say this right off the bat. The Raiders are not trading Darren Waller. He's, he's, his salary hit is, is unbelievably small. The Raiders played a, bi- a blinder extending him when they did, and they are not going to move him and take away what would be Russell Wilson's top weapon. So we can forget that one. Now, with the Raiders, I think there are two main things. First of all, you're going to get your picks. So I think three first and the second is what we had before. I think you could get a couple of players out of the Raiders. One of them is a quarterback, obviously, whether that's Derek Carr or Marcus Mariota, whoever the Seahawks prefer. I think Derek Carr gets a bad rap, frankly. I'm not trying to argue that he's an elite quarterback or that he's capable of leading a team to a Super Bowl. I don't know that, okay? But here's what I do know about Derek Carr. When he was drafted in 2014, he was drafted by a 3-13 and team. And two years later, he was the MVP frontrunner, and he was leading the Raiders to a 12-4 and finish. And then he got injured right at the end of the season, which was a crushing blow for the Raiders, and they lost in the playoffs in the first week. And if Derek Carr had stayed healthy, the Raiders were the favorites to win the AFC and go to the Super Bowl that year with Derek Carr as their quarterback. And since that year, he has had a bad hand dealt to him. He's had coaching changes. He's had coaches and GMs changing. He's had you know people not showing much confidence in him. Gruden's come in and seems to have just doubted him every step of the way. He's thrown 170 touchdowns. He's thrown for a ton of yards. He's no trouble. He seems like a good guy. I quite like him based on what I've seen. He's a, he's a guy that's easy to root for. I don't know why he wears guy liner. That's a different matter completely. But but he he's not a bad quarterback. And if and look, if you're trying to limit the damage and still win a few games next year, then Derek Carr, you could do a lot worse than Derek Carr. So I'm throwing him in. I like Marcus Mariota as well, but whatever. Pick, pick your poison. Pick whoever you want out of those two. And then the other player, and this is the one where people are going to hate me for saying this, Robbie, I'm trading Jamal Adams and getting him out of the way and taking his salary off the books and getting a, you know, what I can for him. And then if you do this deal with the Raiders, I'll, I'll bring in Jonathan Abram, which is the player that the Seahawks wanted in 2019 in the draft. They didn't get him. Bring him in instead. Much cheaper. Similar type of player. Um, have him instead alongside Derek Carr, get a whole bunch of picks for Russell Wilson, get a whole bunch of picks for Jamal Adams, uh, create a whole load of salary for 2022, go and have a bit of a splurge in free agency, use your draft picks, get a whole bunch of new players, fill your holes, fill your boots. I think it could be a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the trade. The only thing of, I, that worries me about um, about Derek Carr is I was reading something about his play action uh, that one qualm about how Carr would mesh in Seattle's play action and deep shot oriented attack is he's 23rd, 25th, 35th, and 38th in the NFL in play action percentages over the past four seasons. So that's kind of interesting. I wonder how well he would play in play into that, but um, you never know. I mean, he, he has the arm strength to do it. He, you know, maybe it just, who knows what the case might be for that. Uh, so this, this guy, Logan uh, Ulrich, he wrote this trade proposal with the uh, with the Raiders, and, and I and I'm kind of interested in it. So the Seahawks give up Russell Wilson. They trade a 2020 or 2021 first round, 2022, 2023 first round. Get a 2023rd, 
second round, they get Derek Carr and then defensive end Max Crosby, which I found fairly interesting. Guy had 10 sacks last year. Um, seems like he's a could be a, a, a decent player, first of all. Also fills the need kind of like a Khalil Mack. Not, obviously not Khalil Mack level. Not trying to compare the two. Just saying that that's someone who, who uh, that he came up with as, as, as a trade target. But I mean, I really like your idea as well. I mean, I, I, that's a trade that I'm more on board with. Like I said, again, trading Russ into the AFC instead of the NFC is something that I'm more interested in. So for the for me, going with that Raiders, Raiders uh, trade is, you know, plus you can get something back and get a quarterback who can at least be serviceable, that can still allow you to win some games. You know, I don't, I don't don't like the idea of trading him to a team not having a quarterback in place and then having to figure that out later uh getting a Mariota or a Derek Carr back you know someone who can play the game uh and has you know proven to be NFL caliber quarterback is is something that I want I want to be able to go root for a team that has a chance to win still I don't want to like if we're going to blow it up then blow it up but I don't want to like be rooting for a team where you know we're going to be you know, four and twelve I don't want that I want to be I want want to root for the Seahawks to, to be competitive and such. So for, for me, go get the guys that allows us to do that. Yeah, I think it's a trade that has, you know, some appeal. I mean, I, it's just, I don't know. I mean, it, people will see it differently, Robbie. I mean, the thing is, is that we're coming at this, or at least this was the intention to come at this from, look, let's just imagine a scenario where maybe I didn't lay this out well enough at the start. Let's imagine a scenario where Russell Wilson is going to be traded. And now let's find a deal that, you know, you can be comfortable with. That's really what this is. So people will, will listen to what we've just said and they will go, yeah, but Derek Carr's nowhere near as good as Russell Wilson. And I'm not, I say, well, yeah, but that's not the point. The point is like, how do you move on? And how do you sort of give yourself a chance to not be useless next year? Because let's not forget, they haven't got a first, unless they trade Jamal Adams back to the Jets, they haven't got their first round pick next year. So if they finish in the top, if, they, if they're a top 10 draft pick team next year, they, they're giving a pick to the Jets like the Texans have just done to the Dolphins. So you've kind of got to be good to some extent. And Derek Carr enables you not to be awful. And frankly, you know, that's, unless the Seahawks can find a way to take all of the picks they get from Russell Wilson and give them to the Texans for Deshaun Watson, which, look, maybe that's something they should consider. I don't know. Maybe, we, maybe that's something we can talk about if a Wilson trade happens. Um, I'd certainly be not totally against that. But um, let's just say that Wilson goes and you're moving forward. It's, it makes some sense and it works to what Pete Carroll wants to do, always compete, to then have Derek Carr, then maybe go and draft a quarterback at some point in the first three rounds and say, okay, we have a young guy, we have an older guy, off you go. And maybe even bring in another one. Remember in 2012, there was Flynn, there was Jack Tavares Jackson, there was Russell Wilson. Three guys competing for the starting job, off you go, right? And then you get a whole bunch of picks. Look, you've got Jonathan Abram in there. You move Jamal Adams. You, you've then got a whole bunch of picks and you just bring in a whole bunch of defensive and offensive linemen and build up your trenches, Robbie. And you go out there next year feeling like really happy with the row line, really happy with the D line. Carr, Metcalf, Lock it, decent secretary, bring Sherm back, fresh start. I'm telling you, okay? Week one of the season, most Seahawks fans, would they miss Russell Wilson? Yes. Would they be nervous? Yes. Would they have some excitement about seeing that Seahawks team the week before the season began? Of course. And that's really, you just don't want to feel like it's a lost cause. And that's why I think that kind of a deal works. And yeah, you know what? It sort of tacks on the Jamal Adams trade. I'm, I'm doing that anyway. I just don't think. And listen, if they trade Russell Wilson, I think Jamal Adams might request a trade himself anyway. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens with, with that. The other team to look at is, of course, the Saints. Now, Saints are tens of millions over the cap. I think they will be very happy to give up the picks, Robbie. They're good at drafting. They've had success drafting. They have a good roster. Whether they lose a couple of players or not, they will still have a good roster. It's kind of like running through and seeing, you know, who would you want and who would the Saints be willing to sacrifice? So the questions that I would ask were, you know, because I, I, I'm not interested in Taysom Hill. I'll tell you one thing that just, I'll come back to it. I don't want to sort of interrupt myself and confuse people. So I don't want Taysom Hill. Um, I, they're not going to trade out Alvin Kamara. The money's just ridiculous. Um, the players that I would sort of be looking at if I was the Seahawks would be Ryan Ramchick. Could you get him? Cam Jordan. 
could you get Cam Jordan? And I'd ask about Marshall and Latimer, but I don't think they would give up Marshall and Latimer. But I think the first two they might do. And, and then you really sort of, if the Saints call, which is what I said earlier, and say, what do you want? And you name the picks and those two players. I'm not worried about picking 30th overall or wherever the Saints are picking it, you know, this year and for the next few years. Because I can take Cam Jordan and plonk him on the defensive line. I can plonk Ryan Ramchick on the other side of the ball and feel protected. And I've got a whole bunch of picks. You've got to find a quarterback, admittedly. But you've got quality in the two areas that I've been boring people to death about for the last four weeks, Robbie, the trenches. And you've got a whole bunch of picks there that you might be able to draft a quarterback. And I still want to talk about two potential targets in the draft at quarterback that may be an option there for you. And you, maybe you go out and get a Marcus Mariota and trade for him. Or you, Ryan, Ryan Fitzpatrick, I don't know. I mean, look, I, I'm not trying to say that Ryan Fitzpatrick's going to win you a bunch of games. I'm just sort of giving names out there that can place hold for a bit while a rookie gets up to speed or until you can find somebody else. I'm just trying to come with options. Now, that kind of a trade, three, three, uh, three firsts, a second, maybe some more, with Ramchick and Cam Jordan, I'm not hanging up the phone. I'm, I'm sort of lingering on that. I'm having a chat and a co- cup of coffee about it. I'm thinking about it. What do you think? Yeah, I'm listening. I mean, I'm listening for sure. I think we still run into the same problem with the quarterback scenario. And, and, um, but, yeah, I'm listening. I, I would I go back to the Raiders and be like, hey, what other player can you give us as well uh, on top of uh, on top of Carr and or Mariota or whoever it is you have and, and, and you know, Max Crosby or, or, or Jonathan Abram or whoever it is you're looking at, who else you want to offer into this or what other pick are you looking at getting? You know, I, I'm, I'm leveraging the two against each other and trying to figure out, you know, what what the best offer is. And but uh, yeah, I'm definitely listening to that. I mean, I, I love the idea of it. And you're right. I mean, I know I've seen people say Alvin Kamara or Michael Thomas or whatever, and I just don't think that those guys are realistic. But yeah, I mean, I like the guys that you mentioned. I mean, both good players and both, you know, help that side, or, you know, help the, the line, O-line and D-line. And that's exactly what we want and what we need. So yeah, I'm listening to, the, to their call. Now, um, let me sort of, now are you sat comfortably here, Robbie? Because this, this proposal might make you fall off your chair, right? Because this is what I was going to say when I interrupted myself and I'm going to come out with it now. And I wonder what you think about this. How about in a deal with the saints, you get everything we've just talked about and you do get a quarterback and his name is Drew Brees. He has not retired yet. And even if he had retired, there's nothing to stop him unretiring. Now, am I saying that 42-year-old Drew Brees is the answer to all of Seattle's problems? No, clearly not. But here's what Drew Brees is, a legendary quarterback who knows how to play NFL football, who can get the ball to DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett and maybe a tight end or a third receiver who could give you a year. And what have we just seen? A highly motivated 40-something-year-old quarterback win the Super Bowl. Drew Brees would be the most motivated individual on the planet in that situation. And I'm not saying that the Seahawks would be a contender or a Super Bowl contender if they had Breeze. I'm just saying it could be a lot, lot worse. And if you do want to draft somebody, but not start them straight away, and if we're talking about placeholder guys, Drew Breeze is he could do a lot worse than that. And by the way, you know what his base salary is this year? It's $1 million. It'll cost you a million dollars. What do you think? I mean, I'm not going to say no to it, right? I mean, if, if Drew Brees actually wanted to do that, sure, I would say yes to that. But 
Uh, I, I think, I don't think, first of all, I just don't think Breeze wants to play anywhere but New Orleans, right? I think that he loves it there. And what's going to make him want to come to Seattle? I mean, yeah, he might be motivated, but I don't I think he would look at the Saints situation and be like, I had what Russell Wilson just got. And I'm going to a scenario where, you know, we don't didn't quite have that. You know, the talent in New Orleans right now is a lot better than the talent is in Seattle. So I think I don't know if he would want to do that. But I'm not saying no to that. If he wants to play for Seattle and wants to come here and 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 do that, yeah, I mean, yeah, why wouldn't you want that? I mean, they he's competitive. He, he you know he's a he's a good player. He you know he knows how to win. You know he can do a lot of things that we would want him to do. Uh, I mean, he's not quite as mobile as as Russ is. So you're going to need to make sure that 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 offensive line is is you know beefed up for sure. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm definitely not hanging up the phone on that. So what I would say, and listen, first of all, because I can just anticipate what's going to happen now. Somebody on some website somewhere or Twitter will put, oh, Staten wants them to trade for Drew Brees. What an idiot. Listen, we're just coming up with proposals here. It's an interesting idea. You know, you've got to kind of think out of the box a little bit. We're talking about trading Russell Wilson for crying out loud. You know, you have to come up with a few zany ideas. And listen, it's fun to talk about this. It's more fun than sort of talking about what Mark Rogers has said. So like, look, Here's, here's what it is, right? You're right. Drew Brees wants to play in New Orleans. But Drew Brees also does, wants to go out as a winner. And he's not retired yet. You know, and why is he not retired? Because there was a report from Jay Glazer right at the end of the year, before the final game that he played, saying this is Drew Brees' last season. It's his last season. That was, what, six, seven weeks ago? He still hasn't retired. And it seems to me like he's keeping his options open. Now, if he, if he was told, listen, it's like he's, he's sat at home, he's, he's kind of watching whatever people watch on the TV these days, and the phone rings and he answers it, and it's Pete Cow, and Pete says, how about one last dance, Drew? I don't think Pete would say it like that. But, you know, if he said those words or whatever, you know, and said, how about it? I think he would think about it. And he might say no. But... The other thing we've got to remember here is Drew Brees doesn't want to cook. Drew Brees knows who he is now. He doesn't want what Russell Wilson wants. He doesn't want to be throwing it 50 times a game and putting up huge numbers. He just wants to win. And if Pete Carroll sells him on, listen, we're going to just have, we're going to have picks. We're going to have cap space. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to build up the whole line, you know, do a lot of the things that Russell Wilson wants the Seahawks to do. <laughs> We're going to do all these things. How about it? Why not give it a try for one year? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that he would say yes or no. I, I don't know what he would say. He might have a, give it a good long thing and say thanks, but no thanks. But he might just say yes. And it's just something that nobody's considered at this point. And again, I am not saying that this is a great option that this is an ideal situation. I'm not saying that I want to trade Russell Wilson for Drew Brees, and I think that's better. I'm just saying, if you do trade Russell Wilson, you have to have a solution. And talking about the next two guys I'm going to talk about and starting them as rookies, to me, Robbie is not a solution on its own or making them compete with Geno Smith, you know, or Jameis Winston. You know, the, the solution for me is you acquire a quarterback of some reputation who can come in and you draft a quarterback and you maybe bring somebody else in and you let them compete and you let them compete for the job may the best man win etc etc that's what i think is the way forward because you are not going to draft a Mahomes or a watson or somebody like that in the first round this year and they don't even have a first round pick and if it's the saints one it's at the end of the first round so that's all i'm saying i don't think it's the weirdest suggestion ever have you got a final thought on the inevitable trade of Drew Brees to the Seahawks? And it's going to cost a million dollars, a million dollars. No, no. I mean, Pete would have to sell him on it. That's my only thing. Is I, I still think, I think this Drew is probably going to retire. I don't think he wants to give it one last dance, but you never know. I mean, anything's possible. And it is fun to talk about, right? I mean, 
I, you know, if you want my suggestion, I still think you, you, you convince Russ that Miami is the team that you go for. You try to snag their third and their 18th pick this year, another first and a second, and maybe take Tua, even though I'm not sold on Tua, but at least you, you bring Tua in and you draft a quarterback at number three and you have the two compete. And that for me, that's the most intriguing prospect just the third most interesting team i should say uh just for the simple fact that you know they have the cap space they have the draft capital they have a, a player that they could they could give us that could can play right now that's already played i think that's the team that i'd like to see it happen it's again it's the afc as well which i'm all for if you're going to trade them trade them to an afc team i don't want to put him in the nfc by any means the last thing i want to do is get it all together go face a new orleans saints led russell wilson team and have to lose to Russ and the Saints in the playoffs. I don't want to do that. Just don't. So it's not going to happen, Robbie. Because what's going to happen is Drew Brees is going to lead. <laughs> he's going to lead the Seahawks to a to a, a twelve and four season. He's going to go into New Orleans, or Russell's going to have to come back to Seattle. And Drew Brees is going to beat the Saints. That's what's going to happen. It's going to be the Saints fans going. I don't want to face face Drew Brees. That's right. what, that's what. I, listen, I I would be. I, as much as Drew Brees looked every bit 42 years old in that last season, um, I'll be pumped, as Pete might say, at the thought of him coming over and finishing it off in Seattle and, and, and giving it a go. Uh, listen, I, I don't think it's going to happen either, but I, it's just fun. And listen, let's have some fun with this, you know, because everyone's so depressed about everything and about Russell and, and all that. And, you know, I hope that it's just made a few people think and smile and, Whatever. Like, let's finish with a couple of guys I've written about today because I just wanted to. We don't really talk much draft on the podcast, um, and and I just wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about these two players, Davis Mills at Stanford and Kellen Mond. So everybody talks about the Trey Lance, and obviously Trevor Lawrence is going to go number one. Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Zach Wilson. I've since the Wilson stuff started, Robbie. I have watched a lot of their games. I've written a little bit about them. I will write more about them if when Wilson is traded and knowing where the Seahawks pick in the draft. Mac Jones, I've watched him as well. Okay. And there are things like Zach Wilson will, you know, scramble out of the pocket. He'll be looking to the right sideline. And without looking, he sort of does that Mahomes thing and throws it across his body. And it's like a laser. It's as if he's playing Madden. It's right on the money and it's 40 yards downfield and it's impressive. And you just go, wow. But then there are little things like, you know, someone's running a basic inside slant and the guy's wide open and the play is designed for that to be your number one read. And for some reason, Zach Wilson's not even looking at it. It throws it to a guy who's covered on the right-hand side. And look, it, sometimes it gets there, sometimes it doesn't. But you're kind of thinking, what's he seeing there? And you think, well, that's a lack of playing time. That's, you know, is that something that you can knock out of him? Is it something that he will just learn not to do once he's got in a scheme, NFL coaches, NFL lifestyle? You don't know. And look, they all do that. Trey Lance does that. He turns down obvious reads. He is not patient in the pocket. But then, you know, he throws it on a frozen rope to the sideline, 40 yards, and you think, wow, what an arm. You know, he bulldozes someone over and running for a first down. You look at Justin Fields, he's scrambling around, he's making plays. But the problem with Justin Fields is, as soon as he gets any pressure, eyes drop down. You know, he's, he's kind of like a one-read kind of guy. He's, he's not... If you want him to play within a structure, he's not going to do it. If you want him to play backyard football, he's better at that. So those are those guys. Matt Jones, very methodical, stays on schedule, gets you in and out of the plays. I really worry about his arm strength. I think he got a lot of downfield completions, Robbie, and a lot of it is, you know, in the NFL that might get picked off or that was a, that was a competitive catch there that the receivers battled for. And I think at the next level, um, when Devonta Smith isn't 20 times better than the player he's coming up against, that might well get picked. And then in the red zone in the senior bowl, there was a distinctly big difference between Matt Jones throwing in the red zone and, say, Kellen Mond. You know, it just, there was no real sharpness on his throws, no venom in his throws. Um, so, they're, so they're sort of the top guys. I don't think there's a huge drop to people like Davis Mills and Kellen Mond. In fact, when you look at Davis Mills, I think that he has everything, Robbie, that you would look for in a top 10 pick. And I think that he would be a top 10 pick if he'd played for three years at Stanford. And let's say Stanford had won the Pac-12 within that sort of time frame. Because his main bulk of his starts have come off the back of the KJ Costello disaster and the COVID-impacted season, nobody's really talking about him. There's no real momentum there. But he's great size, very highly recruited, very accurate, 
throws the ball into areas, even with current receivers, that means that they can go and make a play. I think he's very poised. He's, he's mobile enough. I, you know, only one hitch, you no know, mucking about in the pocket, gets the ball out, can get the ball downfield. He's not going to rock it arm. He's got just enough arm strength. I think he can get stronger. I think he's got the frame to get strong. He's a big guy. I think he can put a bit of muscle on and get even stronger over time. Um, seems to be very balanced, very calm, very collected. No real up and down in terms of his personality. Looks like a, he's got ice cold sort of fa facial expression all the time. Like he's just, you know, pondering, you know, whether he's got his bank details correct in a form. You know, it's kind of like that's what his face looks like. And I don't mind that in a quarterback. You know, it's all right for them to be boring. Um, you know, sometimes it's better than, than having them do a GQ, GQ shoot and call themselves Mr. Unlimited. So, um, and have a perfume. So it's it's fine that you know he's like that. I don't have an issue with that, and I quite like him, Bobby. And I think actually, if you are looking for an opportunity to get a quarterback with a lot of potential who could have gone much higher with a bit more experience, then this is the kind of opportunity you get a guy in round two, round three that you might need to develop, might need a bit of time, but has got that potential that you otherwise wouldn't be able to get towards. So I like him a lot. Um, and then with Keller Mond, I think what you've got with Keller Mond is big absolute rocket of an arm i mean he just sort of arm goes back whoosh, out it comes whoosh, like you can almost hear the ball because there's no fans like sailing through the air cutting that air in half as it finds the target robbie beautiful post throw against florida right down the hash in cover to a receiver who was covered right on the money some unbelievable throws over one defender a linebacker but in front of defensive backs throws to the sideline throws the red line at the senior bowl. My word, what a performance. Why is no one's talking about him at the senior bowl? In the practice sessions, I watched the, the practice sessions because someone's put it very generously, put about five minutes of just Kellen Mond on YouTube. The number of times he made a play and the sideline was hooping and hollering because of what he did, that wasn't happening with anybody else. And, and I noticed it. And um, red zone great, two minute drills at the senior bowl, Robbie was an absolute boss in those when people like Newsom, the, the guy who was supposed to go to Georgia and quit and then didn't play last year, who was at Wake Forest, really struggled, not Keller Mond. And then in the game, he had a bit of a crappy start in the game, took over in the second half, two scoring drives, looked fantastic. Um, there's something there with Keller Mond. You know, I think he could be, as I've said before, a Dak Prescott type player who has everything it takes to start in the NFL. Okay, he's not special. He's not Mahomes. He's not Watson. He's not Trevor Lawrence. He's not Josh Allen, okay? But he's good. And I don't know why he's sort of, why, for example, Trey Lance is here and Keller Mond's kind of like here. It doesn't, like, even if he, Lance is better, it's, it's more like that for me. So I think there's a lot to like there. He kind of reminds me of like a less mobile Kaepernick, but more accurate Kaepernick. You know, Kaepernick was a bit reckless and his release was a bit spear-like. You know, Mond's a bit more... Whoosh. So I, I like Keller Mond. And listen, if the Seahawks don't trade Russell Wilson, I'd like them to be in a position where they traded picks and got a few extra picks, where they can take one of these two guys and stash them. And if they do trade him, Robbie, and they get a Derek Carr or a Drew Brees, or they get a, you know, whoever else... I'd like to see them get one of these guys and stash them anyway. And if it doesn't work out, who cares? You know, you've got to kind of buy lottery tickets now. That's where we're at. If you're moving on from Russell Wilson this year or next, you've got to buy some lottery tickets. Davis Mills, Kellen Mond, two players that I like. Yeah, I went, I went and watched some, some Davis Mills highlights and uh, a couple of things on him that just stood out right away. He seems to lock kind of one receiver doesn't he doesn't really go through his progressions very well um that kind of bothered me just a little bit i mean but he seems to have just the toughness the grittiness I mean, he doesn't seem like he's the most athletic quarterback by any means um the knee injury kind of bothers me a little bit as well um but he he seems to i mean there's a couple times where he just blew my mind with some of his throws but yeah, I mean, for me, he's kind of more of a, you know, I'm not taking him in the first or not even if I'm taking him in the second, maybe the third round uh, kind of a player. But Kellamond, I, I think you're onto something with him, man. I, I really, really liked him. And uh, he, he is, a, he surprised me. I mean, and, and kind of what you said, he just, he just, he, there's something about him and, and it's hard to put a finger on. It. I mean, yeah, he might not be Mahomes or even a Josh Allen, but I mean, he has all the intangibles and he seems like a guy that could really, 
you know, really take take over a game. And 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 these, and, and if you draft either of them, I think you're right. They they have to sit for a year or whatever. I don't think they come in and start right away. But these are two players that you know I definitely would keep my eye on. Um, you know, I'm 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 more interested in Kellen than I am in, in Davis. But you know, Davis has he. You know, I wish I I wish there was more tape on him. You know, I wish he had played more because I think you're right. I mean, if he would have stayed another year, he maybe he would be even higher or whatever. But yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting to see these two guys and 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 you, you bring them up because they're they're, they're two players that I, I I could definitely see us taking and 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 stashing to see you know what 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 we can get. And you're right, you have to if you're gonna trade Russ or even if you don't trade Russ, you know things seem to be escalating in a way where Russ doesn't seem like he's gonna retire as a Seahawk unless for some reason Pete retires and goes, which might not happen you got to buy some lottery tickets like you said and and see what you can get you got to roll the dice and 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 figure it out because you know i I don't want to be in a situation where you know we're we're having to trade a bunch of draft picks to go get another quarterback like i'd rather draft one and have someone waiting in the wings and and the opportunity is there we gotta we gotta cash in now I think one one final point so this has been a long podcast but i hope it's been an enjoyable one at a weird time for seals fans um it's kind of working out what John Schneider likes, Robbie. And, you know, the only real quarterback, I mean, he's only drafted two quarterback, quarterbacks in his time in Seattle. And it's kind of a weird, it's kind of a weird mix. So like one of the first things they did, Robbie, when they got here in 2010 was to trade a third round pick to the San Diego Chargers, San Diego at the time, and, and swap picks. So Seattle had a high second and the Chargers had a late second. So they swapped picks and gave up a third which was a high third for charlie whitehurst um and whitehurst had 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 a a a reasonable career at clemson and john schneider had kind of remembered that but that was quite an aggressive trade at the time um for a player who never really started and obviously they they liked the physical and physical tools but didn't like perhaps the mental makeup or the the actual play when he got here because he never actually did anything. But that was an expensive trade that people forget about. Um, apparently, John Schneider really liked Andy Dalton. Now, I'd heard different things about how Seattle ranked the quarterbacks in 2011. You know, I used to have a, 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 a bit of a source um, who, who liked the blog at the time. And I trusted him because he told me that the Seahawks were going to trade for Marshawn Lynch about a week before they did. And... He told me that what the sort of the rankings were in the end for the 2011 draft and Dalton was not at the top. Um, I think Blaine Gabbert, he said, was their sort of like top guy, which is, you know, sounds ridiculous now, but at the time, a lot of people had Blaine Gabbert kind of number one. And I was, I think I remember saying that Kaepernick was two. That's how I, that's what he said. I think I'd have to go back and have a look, but all the talk was Robbie after that draft was that Schneider really wanted Dalton and Carroll said no. So when you think of Dalton, he didn't have the big physical tools. He wasn't a big guy. He wasn't Charlie Whitehurst or, you know, Josh Allen. He was just a very storied TCU quarterback who played there for a long time. Um, But that's the thing. A lot of experience in college, a lot of stats, a lot of success, a lot of winning. And then there was Russell Wilson, who, again, wasn't the big sort of physical guy, but had all of the tools that they looked for, huge college career lots of success Robbie great you know numbers carrots everything Schneider loved him Carol allowed Schneider to take him in round three and he won the job and the rest is history but then you sort of fast forward a few years and then you know the reports which you know Chris Sims said this first which was that they'd spoken to uh, the Browns about trading for the first overall pick in 2018 and everyone went, oh, what's Chris Sims now and then oh guess what Chris Mortensen backed that up last week and the athletic article mentioned it this week as well. So maybe don't be too dismissive of people saying very direct things like that in future is my message to everybody. But if the Seahawks were really into Josh Allen, Josh Allen did not have a good career, Robbie, at Wyoming. He had a lot of interceptions, a lot of stop-start play, didn't play many games, um, but he looked amazing at the Senior Bowl. I mean, he was just a, it's one of the best Senior Bowl game performances I you know, will ever see. It was, it was unbelievable. Looked fantastic. Had everything, hand, big hands, arm, size, mobility, everything. So I can see why they... So what do the Seahawks actually look for in a quarterback is a question. And then when I thought about these two that we're talking about here, 
You know, Kellen Mond's played for four years at Texas A&M. So he's played a long time. He's won a lot of games. He's put up a lot of stats. So that ticks that box. Um, but then he's not, he's big and he's got a strong arm. But is he, is he this sort of physical phenom sort of type? And has he won and has he had the, the credit that kind of Andy Dalton had, who nearly went in the first round, let's, let's not forget. And that's where Schneider wanted to take him. Whereby Schneider would say, oh, I, I love that guy. I'm going to take him. I'm not sure. I like him a lot. Will Schneider, I'm not sure. And with Davis Mills, he's played, 11, I think, 11 starts, 10 or 11 starts, Robbie, in college. He's not big, physical, strong-armed. He's big. He's well-sized. He's mobile. He's a good athlete. But he's more of a prototype, I would say, than perhaps sort of this incredible physical beast of a quarterback. And it does make me think, you know, Part of me almost thinks, well, wouldn't, would they probably go for someone like Trey Lance because of the physicality rather than somebody like these two? But then part of me thinks, well, they're not going to get Trey Lance, so they have, to, they have to look elsewhere. And then I tried to look at other quarterbacks, and Ian Book's played for Notre Dame a long time, and he's got 10-inch hands, even though he's quite short like Wilson. I thought, oh, isn't he somebody to be interested in? And then I went and watched a load of his games this week, and I thought, no chance, because his, his play is just poor. It's just, it's, I just cannot imagine that at all. Um, but I think it's interesting because you kind of have to look at wh what they like in a player, don't you? On top of just who does, who looks good on a few games when you watch them on YouTube or whatever. Yeah, it's hard to know what they like in a quarterback. Like like you said, I mean, you know, Russ is 5'11", 5'10", 5'11", and you know, Charlie Whitehurst was what? He was like 6'3", or something like that. And, you know, what was uh, Matt Flynn and Tavares Jackson? I mean, they've had just a different range, and they went out and when they that they did draft another quarterback, Alex Magoo or whatever his name is, uh, you know, he, he was a big dude. So, yeah, diff different in, in terms of what they actually look for in, in a quarterback. And it's hard to know. Like, you know, typically they have – you know, they like their corners to be a certain size. They like their running backs to be a certain size. They like, you know, certain things on the line and, and what they're going for. But when it comes to quarterback, they're kind of all over the map. So it's kind of hard to know exactly what they're looking for. And, and, and that's because they haven't had to, you know, they haven't had to draft that many. And, and you know, the, the, the move they made, they're all different compared. So, you know, you look at these players and, and one thing is I, 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 I just uh, there's something about about Kalamon that I really really like. Um, I can't quite put a finger on it. Or I don't know why, but I just like the way he plays. And, and he just looks like you're right. He kind of reminds me of a little bit of a Dak Prescott, um, and and seems like he might have the, the ability to do it. Um, Davis Mills, I think, is a little bit more of a pro uh, prospect. And and again, there's just not enough tape on him. That it's, they're, they're two interesting guys. Regardless, we're gonna have to start looking at quarterbacks. I mean no matter what. And I think this year we're going to have to take one. I mean, you can't have, you can't go. I mean, we, first of all, we don't have the draft cap or the, the, the salary cap to go out and to re-sign Geno Smith anyways, even if we wanted to, I just don't think we can pay him. Um, I mean, unless he's going to come back for a league minimum or whatever, but I mean, even then, is that who you really want to the bank on, you know, going forward? So I think we need to have somebody, you know, in the chamber ready to go that we're developing. So you know, we're going to have to draft somebody and, and, and these are, I think two excellent players that you've you've highlighted that are, are guys that we should look at. Well, there we go. The longest podcast we've ever done, and it and perhaps justified given what is going on right now. If you got this far, congratulations, you've done well to uh, and survive um, what was like a ninety minute podcast. But appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Check out the channel. There's a whole bunch of interviews on there. You know, Kay Johnson. I, I loved speaking to Kay Johnson. Um, receiver from South Dakota State would love state would love the Seahawks to draft him. There's a whole bunch of other interviews on there coming up. We've got uh, Darius Stills still to come, Benjamin St. Juiced. They're in the chamber as well for uh, reaching their way onto YouTube. Um, possibly do that over the weekend, if not the start of next week, depending on what the latest is with this whole Russell Wilson thing. Subscribe to the channel and you will never miss a video. You will never miss any of the podcasts or any of the interviews. Please like the video, comment share it around, get onto forums, get onto Reddit, get everywhere, share the podcast, share the interviews, help us out, help raise the attention of the channel. And uh, thank you for watching. Let's hope that this saga is going to come to an end soon and the resolution is a positive one for the Seahawks. Stay safe and we'll speak again soon.